Hello everybody. So the topic today is plant health care. And so what is plant health care? Well, when we're really talking about plant health care, we're really just talking about um, an idea of a holistic, comprehensive program that's going to manage the health structure and appearance of plants in the landscape. So let's kind of take those three parts, the health, the structure, and the appearance, and kind of just talk about that idea. Why those three things and why are those important? Well, when we're really thinking about urban forestry, we definitely want our trees to be healthy because if we have healthy trees, then we have trees that we need to spend less time managing. And less time spent managing means less money. Now, um, when we talk about this, uh, the management options and things uh, later on, we'll kind of see that maybe we do a lot more upfront management and a lot more upfront monitoring to try and avoid having problems later on down the road. But that's the idea um, when we're thinking about the health of it. In terms of the structure of our trees, we want our trees to look good. We want our trees um, to accomplish certain things. Um, for instance, anybody who's been to the southeastern U.S., the idea of uh, planting live oaks in parks and having the big, long, swooping branches that are going to stick over the sidewalk and provide a bunch of shade and the idea of, of a city like Savannah, Georgia, where they created enough city parks that you could um, you could walk park to park um, and without uh, you don't have to go very far in order to get to another park. And that way you can always be able to to get to this little respite and get to um, get to this area of shade. That whole thing, that idea now that if we know that idea and we know the importance of those trees, then we know that there's a reason why those trees have to look a certain way. And then that's why the structure is going to be important. And then uh, the same thing with the appearance of the plants, because ultimately we're putting these things in um, in our cityscapes because we want we want um, we want them to add to the cityscape. We don't want it to just be the idea that, well, here's a tree. Oh, that tree's kind of ugly. Well, whatever. It's a tree. Like it, it works. It's fine. No, that doesn't. That doesn't really work for most people. It, it, it has to accomplish, um, has to accomplish the goals of putting a tree, uh, in, uh, the, the urban landscape. But at the same time, it's got to be a nice looking tree. It's got to be a well manicured tree. It's got to be a nice healthy tree, because that's ultimately what's going to make people want to have more trees in the landscape, and that's what we want. Um, we do know that tree health problems are a result of many factors and not just a single agent. So that's that's uh, super important to understand because it's usually it's it's a complexity of things. It's kind of like the same thing when we get sick. When we get sick, we um, sometimes it's just one thing, but sometimes it could be a couple of things that then led to that one thing. So it's you just have to kind of understand um, everything. And we discussed this in the in the previous talk about um, how do we figure out how to diagnose a tree and, and how far back can we go and what are all the different factors that we're going to look at. And what that really leads us to is a holistic approach. And with the idea of a holistic approach, all we're really talking about is we've got to really take into account the whole picture of the whole urban ecosystem. You know, how are we going to figure out how to correctly diagnose these plants? Well, we're going to have to know everything that's going on in the ecosystem. And we're going to have to have a really good understanding of what all of our trees do and how are they affected. And if we change one of these things, what's going to happen to the rest of the ecosystem? And all of that has to be taken into account. I mean, technically, you don't have to take anything into account but we want to do a good job and if we want to do a good job one of the easiest ways uh, to do a good job is to try and stop problems before they start so really focusing on proper planting plant selection soil cultural practices if we can we want to get in there right at the beginning um, and design the landscape and select the right plants so that we just don't even have to deal with a lot of the issues that could come up so the golf course example that the book gives, I think, is a really good one because the idea of a golf course um, for us as arborists is much different uh, than for, for a golf course manager because the grass is the most important part of a golf course. But yet a hugely important part of golf courses are trees and using trees not only as um, 
as areas that provide shade, but also areas that provide difficulty and also provide um, wildlife habitat and provide a lot of, um, um, how shall I put it, aesthetic structure to the golf course. Because the golf course, um, if anybody's really into golf, I am. Um, it, there's a big difference between playing something like, um, like Augusta National, where you've got trees and you got these small fairways and all that, or a Lynx course at St. Andrews, where there aren't really any trees and it's just all the holes and you can see all the holes right next to each other. There's a big difference. I mean, um, trees, trees with golf courses play a hugely important role. I mean, if you, anybody who knows about Pebble Beach, Pebble Beach is like one of the, it's like one of the most expensive golf courses in the whole world. And on their logo is a tree, is the, is the Monterey Cypress that, that is, that lines the coast and, and is, um, picturesque on, on that golf course. So the trees are important, but the trees are definitely not as important to the, um, to the golf course manager as the grass is because the grass affects how the ball bounces and the way the course plays so the grass is hugely important but we still we want to manage the tree so we could it could be this fight of the arborist versus the um versus the golf course manager versus the turf grass manager or any of that stuff or we can all work together and understand how it's all going to play together and really look at the idea of how the whole golf course and all the things and all the neighboring communities to the golf course and how all that is going to play together right because if we get something like improper irrigation like we really need to water the grass a bunch but then that's going to cause a problem with these trees so then we have to make sure well we might want to water a bunch but we can't water too much or else this is going to happen to the trees or we can't fertilize the grass too much because then we're going to bring in this pest and then this pest is going to chip the trees and then all the leaves and the fruit are going to fall on the course that sort of thing or making sure that we've um cut out areas or um, put mulch down so that we don't get mower damage on tree trunks because we know these things are going to get mowed a ton or the different shade issues like you can see in this picture where our green area where we want really short grass and really nice we don't have any shade around that but the other parts of the course we have some shade going on that could um, make it make it sort of trickier so learning how to balance all that out and learning how to put it all together that um, I think just is a really good example of what we're talking about with this holistic approach of plant health care. And you can't just be like, well, this is what the trees need. We do know that that's important to us. That's absolutely what we want. But we have to think about what does the turf grass manager need? What does the golf course need overall? What is going to be the best thing? What's what's important and what is really um, what's really driving what we do? And then now let's manage the trees based on that. So what is a healthy plant or a healthy tree? How do we define it? If you look at this tree in this picture here, do you say that's a healthy tree? And if so, what makes it a healthy tree? Well, um, a plant is considered healthy when it is free of disorders and pests and has sufficient ability to resist stress. And I think that second part is, is um, the most important part where it's got the ability to resist stress. So if it's healthy, if something happens to it, it's still gonna, it's still gonna be fine. It's gotta be something really serious if it's gonna take down a, a nice, perfectly healthy tree. And then in discussing a healthy plant, there's two terms. There's vitality and vigor. And when we're talking about vitality, we're talking about a plant's ability to deal effectively with stress in a given environment. And that's the one that we're really thinking about is the vitality of a tree because most of plant health care is going to deal with the idea of vitality because we're actually coming in um, sometimes after the problem is already there. And that's that's where we're really focused on vitality. Whereas if you hear the term vigor, vigor really refers more to the plant's inherent genetic capacity to resist stress. So the idea of how that what that plant already is capable of doing when it comes to comes to certain stressors. So our trees have four primary functions in terms of resource allocation. And so what we mean by resource allocation is that the tree is is through photosynthesis is converting sugars and it's pulling water uh, out of the soil from the roots and also pulling essential minerals and then it's got to decide what to do with all that stuff and so there's four things that trees do 
They, they maintain, they grow, they store, and they defend. And so sometimes a tree is going to decide to do one of those things more than another. So if we take just the basic example of, of shade, uh, intolerant trees versus shade, tolerant trees are the idea of, of really specifically more like a pioneering um, shade uh, shade intolerant tree, one that just wants to get up to the sun as quick as possible. They're going to spend way more uh, way more re of their resources on growth and they're going to pull away from things like storage and defense and just say let's spend it on growth and let's get up there and it's not um, it doesn't even have to be just a tree's overall philosophy it can change during um, certain parts uh, it, when you think about something like a longleaf pine down in the southeastern U.S., there's a point where it goes from just what they call the grass stage, where it's sitting right on the ground, to all of a sudden it shoots up six feet. And when it does that shoot up six feet, I guarantee it is spending much more of its resources on growing if you're going to just go and just shoot up in a matter of months uh, that many feet. It's got to be spending much more on growth than it is on those other um, four primary functions. There's also other times where it's going to be different. So if you get to a stressful condition with a tree, it's definitely going to start um, s um, sending more um, resources towards defense and towards storage and really trying to make sure that it can avoid the stress or reduce the stress as much as possible. If we just look at this um, and try and take this idea of... Um, of the four main functions and think about the stressors that exist in a city. So if we look at just number one down here on the bottom left, we're talking about the idea of restricted root space. So this tree is not going to be out there spending a whole lot of effort trying to trying to grow and and really trying to get up there and and, and get to the sun because it's it can only get so far. It knows it's going to have um, restricted resources so it might spend some more um, effort into storage or or possibly into defense because it, it if it's going to spend a lot of effort on growing it's not going to get quite the reward that it needs and it just kind of depends on on what sort of different thing are we dealing with and with the urban landscape there's all sorts of things that we're going to be dealing with I mean you can see the extra heat off the pavement the pollution from the vehicles um, poor pruning in some trees, lack of direct sunlight, soil compaction. There's going to be all sorts of different things. And so some of these trees may want to spend because of their natural um, vigor. They might want to spend more on, on growth or they might want to spend more on um, storage and waiting uh, to grow. But it might have to change depending on the situation that it's put in. So let's talk about the idea of the plant healthcare process. And really, so going into this idea of plant healthcare, we've got a program of scheduled chemical and cultural practices with the purpose of enhancing the health and vitality of a tree. And what we're going to talk about is that actually we're going to try and do many more natural and cultural practices before we ever get uh, to the chemical practices. But we really want uh, to stress that this is important for any um anybody doing urban forestry it's really just the idea of let's really take into account what we're doing um it for the process of taking care of our trees we're not just we're not just going to go wing it and figure it out right if we if we uh if we fail to plan then we plan to fail right so we need to make a plan we need to come up with a plan we need to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and see the whole picture and when we can do that then we're going to make the best decisions so going over our process let me move myself out of the way there there we go so the key uh, key is monitoring and examining the plants and their growing detect uh, growing conditions. And early detection is always going to try, always going to prevent bigger issues later. And really understanding uh, early detection, really understanding what species are we planting, where are we planting it, is this a species that's going to be really susceptible to a problem? If it's susceptible to a problem, what is that problem, and how can we avoid it? And just trying to look at it that way. Um, and then, I mean, if we're, if we're even at that stage, maybe we're even at the stage before where we're saying, yeah, but do we really want to plant this tree? And maybe we should plant this other one instead. 
uh, we want to come up with an appropriate response process and uh, what's an appropriate response process well let's throw kind of everything in there the gathering of information assessing the severity and implications of the problem determining your clients expectations formulating all the options possible and then deciding on a course of action really want to do it the right way um, part of the plant health care process is going to be arborist and client education making sure that the arborist is up to date and understands what they're really looking for and what they what they need to know and what they need to understand about the area that they're working in and then being able to also educate their client so that because I mean ultimately the arborist isn't making the decisions the arborist can influence the decision but ultimately the decisions rely with the clients and so if the decision relies with the client you really want your clients to be as educated about the ideas as possible because if they are your life's gonna be easier because they're going to be thinking the way that you're thinking. But if you don't take the time to do that, if you just leave it up to them and just say, well, here's the information, what do you think? It might not go the way that you want it to. So if you want um, the your clients to see it the same way that you see it, or see it, or both of you are working together to really get towards the best answer, then you're going to have to do put in the effort on the education side and, and try and get them to also put in the same effort on the education side. And when you think about that, that takes plant healthcare to really a philosophy, an educational process, and a decision-making process. So we have all these um, uh, guidelines that we put into the idea of plant healthcare, but then it's also just this philosophy, this holistic approach, this ecosystem, urban ecosystem based approach, but then also an educational process, right? We want to learn, we want to understand, and before we decide, before we have to um, do things, we want to really gather as much information as possible and really figure out what is going to be the best approach. What's our short-term games? What's our long-term games? What are going to be all the problems that could come up when we do something like that? We really want to put all of that together and now I gotta slide myself back out of the way and that takes us to integrated pest management so integrated pest management or IPM is an ecosystem based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests through a combination of techniques IPM is the preferred method of plant health care when we're talking about the idea of, of pest management uh, when we're doing uh, integrated pest management, you're really trying to focus on only removing the target organism. And depending on what kind of management you got to use, that might be harder than you think to just only remove the one target organism. Um, whatever treatment is picked out of integrated pest management, the hope is that we're going to apply it in a manner that's going to minimize risks to human health, to beneficial and non-target organisms, and the environment. We don't want to... We don't want to um, to hurt humans. We don't want to hurt any organisms that we're not targeting as pests. And we don't want to hurt the rest of the environment or the rest of the ecosystem because we know that can lead to other problems that we don't want to deal with. So how does IPM work? Switch myself back again. We want to focus on long-term prevention of pests or their damage by managing the whole ecosystem. We want to monitor and correct pest identification to help us decide whether management is going to be needed. We want to combine management approaches for greater effectiveness. We don't want to just do one thing or another thing or another thing when we could do all of them and we could combine them in a way that makes sense that can actually work together. And really, uh, the big thing to focus on with how does IPM work is to really remember what the goal is. And the goal for most IPM um, is that we're just going to manage pests and their damage to a tolerable level because sometimes having pests is okay and sometimes pests are part of just the natural environment and sometimes a pest is necessary it's just when their uh, when their damage gets out of control an easy example uh, in just regular forestry is the idea of bark beetles and with uh, a little bit of climate change and a little bit of winters that aren't so cold you get um, drought in some areas plus the warmer temperatures now all of a sudden the things that would kill off the bark beetle in winter the the freezing temperatures aren't as freezing anymore and now all of a sudden you get more bark beetles and more bark beetles and more bark beetles and now all of a sudden instead of 
a uh, hundred few hundred acres or maybe a few thousand acres now we're talking about millions of acres of of dead trees uh we see this is a huge problem in the sierras right now and so it's really understanding that sometimes we we're not really in the eradication of pest business we're really in the management of pest business and that there are acceptable levels of pests so what is a pest been talking about it any organism that's going to compete with our desirable plants for the same resources any organism that's going to threaten the health structure st structural integrity or appearance of a desirable plants and then any organism that's going to diminish the personal enjoyment utility or safety in the landscape well do you have any examples sure here's a few um, up here on the top left you may not think of it that way because some people might really just enjoy I, for me I enjoy if deer are walking through my yard or walking through my park I like the idea that my park provides wildlife habitat but at the same time if this is a super desirable tree or this is a tree of some sort of uh, significance and then that deer or a group of deer are just mowing that thing down to where it's not gonna um, exist anymore because it's it's a very attractive tree that's gonna be problematic or if you're trying to plant younger versions of the trees and you've got um, the male deer and they're rubbing their antlers and rubbing all the bark off the tree creating injuries that's gonna be problematic uh, we got something as simple as as ladybugs but they can be their you know their leaf eaters and and could give our trees uh, that an appearance that doesn't doesn't work for a lot of people in in the bottom uh, center here this is kudzu now some people might look at this bridge and the kudzu coming through and and be like ooh that that bridge looks pretty for some people it's like oh my god that where the rest of the bridge is going to disappear what are we going to have to do about it on the right here we can see some beaver damage in this park so there's all sorts of different kinds of versions of pests it's not always just talking about um uh, wildlife or insects sometimes it's just the other plants that can take over i mean something like kudzu uh if you just google pictures of kudzu k-u-d-z-u you're going to see just like a vine that had that in some areas literally just goes over the top of everything the trees the whole forest all the grass just miles and miles of this stuff like it can take off and it can just destroy an area um if if given the chance to so you really want to deal with this stuff beforehand but you have to kind of know about it and then you have to really understand make your clients understand it like if you're if we're focusing on this kudzu right here and we're thinking about it and they like the look of it on that on that bridge well then we have to think about the idea that what is a tolerable level of that like if if we can't see through any of these holes on the on the um on the middle part of the bridge is that too much if we can't see any of the the side of this bridge is that too much what is the level that we're going to say no this is when we have to deal with the problem because we have to set some sort of expectation like that because otherwise the problem might take off too far and we can't do anything about it um the beaver damage here now it sucks that that these trees um might fall down it's, it, these trees might stay there for for hundreds of years hard to tell sometimes we might also look at those trees and just say well aesthetically this doesn't work for me well then that means you've got to get rid of the beavers but then if the beavers are also the ones making their beaver dams out there and that's how you're keeping your lake behind there at a certain level that might be problematic as well and so you really have to have to take in this holistic approach and really have to set guidelines you really have to understand what's important and what what do you really want to do with your urban landscape and your urban ecosystem and how do you want the whole thing to function when you want to figure out how you're going to deal with a pest and so let's look at kind of the process when we're talking about um, integrated pest management and really dealing with pests I gotta just slide myself out of the way there we go so it's a five-step process we're gonna identify and monitor uh, to really we want to figure out what are we dealing with and what's going on and um, then we get to evaluation so what are we gonna do 
how are we gonna how are we going to uh, deal with this we're gonna try and prevent so we're gonna um, figure out all sorts of different things are we going to come up with uh, resistant plants are we gonna um, one example one easy example is um, my my mother-in-law she's got a garden and she knows she has some really desirable um, crops that she loves but she knows that she also is going to have to deal with a lot of um, pest problems and so what she does is she plants specific plants out that the air that are going to attract the pest and basically take the pest away from the more valuable to her um, crop species so sometimes we can we can put in other things we can put in barriers we can do all sorts of things to kind of prevent any problems but if that doesn't work then we're gonna to have to take some action and we're gonna to have to try and figure out different ways and we're gonna talk about some management options uh, towards the end of the lecture and then we're back to monitoring again because we don't just well we fixed it now I mean we stopped it for now but remember we said we're gonna manage things to a tolerable level and so that means it's it's got to be a consistent system of management and a consistent system of monitoring because we have to make sure because it's gonna let up oh, got to that level let's take it back down up oh, build back up to that level take it back down it's if when we're talking about the idea of tolerable levels it really involves constant monitoring it really involves the idea that we've got to stay on top of things at all times so that really gets down to then so what are what's the key components what what do we really need to understand about IPM well we we can break it down to the idea that we'd love to prevent the buildup of pests or really prevent the buildup of pests of pests to uh, intolerable levels we want to monitor constantly because we really want to make sure that that we avoid problems before they become a problem and if we do get to the point of a problem then we intervene and we do whatever is most appropriate but when we say appropriate we want to be um, cost effective because we have clients that we want to make happy we want it to be environmentally sound and we want to do um, best going back to that beginning to avoid problems to human health problems to the ecosystem and prom problems to anything that is not the target organism so that's what we really want to do when we're thinking about IPM and integrated pest management. So that leads us to kind of six principles of IPM programs. We want to we want to really make sure we nail pest identification. We got to make sure if we're going to deal with something and we're going to target something, we got to be correct that this is the right thing. We want to monitor and assess the pest numbers and damage. We want to make sure what is what is the damage, what where is it at? How much is there? Can, how can we get a hold of it? We want to establish our guidelines for when management act, action is needed. We want to um, prevent pest problems as long as we can. And then we're going to intervene. We're going to use a con combination of biological, cultural, physical, mechanical, and chemical management tools, whatever it is that, that's taken. We'll talk about those management options. And then after action is taken, we, we're going to assess what we did, and then we're right back to the start so monitoring um, really becomes important uh, throughout this whole process because we really want to make sure that we stay on top of this and we do not have uh, issues just randomly pop up and all of a sudden wait how did this get here no we want to we want to know oh yeah look there is that tree that's probably going to bring in uh, this pest so we really got to make sure a simple example of that, and we'll, we'll talk about it um, in some upcoming slides, is the idea of the emerald dash borer. Well, uh, why why would I have to worry about the emerald dash borer? Well, do you have ash trees? Well, yeah. Well, they only attack ash trees. So if you have ash trees, you should worry about emerald dash borer. Well, I don't have any uh, ash trees in my park. Well, don't worry about emerald dash borer. Some, some things like that really kind of make it easy. But when we're talking about monitoring, we're talking about a program of regular uh, landscape inspections to make observations and collect information to aid in making decisions about the management of pests and other disorders. And so the information we're going to look for is site information, plant information, and disorder information. So let's kind of focus on those three ideas. So when we say site information, and I'll take myself out of the way of this pretty little picture here. There you go. 
So things like recent weather trends. So um, we can uh, you can get into the idea of both uh, weather trends and climatic trends, right? Um, thinking about seasonality and things like that as well. The landscape management practices. So what happens here? So if we're if we take this neighborhood. Um, um, into account and we use that as our example what are the management practices so how who if there's problems in this neighborhood who do people call and what do they do and um, what are the what are the normal pruning practices and um, the areas that aren't um, owned by private individuals who is dealing with that um, with those trees and how is that set up and and what is what is the basic idea if we have a problem with a tree and so just what are the management practices uh, if you have any changes in drainage and land contour so if we're dealing with uh, a lot of slope or um, having erosion issues because we've got um, things on a hill and um, just the idea if we get a good rain then we end up with mudslides and things like that what how does that affect um, what we're going to do any addition or removal of nearby plant material you know if we're if we manage a park in this neighborhood and it's determined that we're going to cut half the park and we need to put up houses how is that going to change uh, the rest of the park that we're managing and then any sort of hardscape construction or repair so now if we're if we're fixing the road or fixing the sidewalk or fixing any of these other things that aren't part of our natural urban environment the um how are, how is that going to affect the natural parts of our urban environment right is that going to lead to soil compaction or or root restriction or if we put up a building is that going to take away um, sunlight and how is that going to affect our trees all of that plays uh, a role slide myself over again in terms of our plant information, we want to know the leaf number, size, and color because really we're trying to, we want to identify the tree correctly if we don't know it already, but we really want to make sure we understand um, what this tree should look like, what uh, what should be its appearance. Because once we know that, then we can actually say, oh yeah, well that tree, that tree's messed up. We need to do something about that tree. But we don't really know that if we can't, if we don't understand just some basics like the leaf size leaf number size and color uh, twig growth so understanding um, being able to look at our early wood um, and our late wood and and seeing when are when it are is our tree growing and is there any parts of the year where it's struggling and seeing if that can tell us any information uh, any symptomatic reactions and really understanding okay well if this is the tree that we're dealing with and we start to see something like we see canker or gall what is the most likely cause of that and then could we trace that back to anything else any signs of disorders do we have any wilting anything going on that that really should um really make us uh, really kind of jump into action or can we wait and see um really understanding the plant condition which is kind of taking all of this into account and then the book also mentions the idea of phenology the relationship between recurring biological events and weather changes um, the easiest one to think about um, because we've just kind of passed it is the idea of green up and i always just think about st patrick's day because um, green is the the color that you wear on st patrick's day but really what that more signifies to me is that's when the trees really start leafing out and that's where everything starts kind of coming back and so how does that um how does that tie in to biological events um such as um really understanding like um which insects um when they when they hatch out the are their larva a problem or or is the adult a problem and um so you know is there certain animals that that like to um that their larva is a problem and that um and the young the young um come out right at right when the tree is trying to grow and in the susceptible stage of you know trying to leaf out and trying to build back up after being dormant but now all of a sudden you've got this bug that releases you know thousands of them and they're they're all want to attack the tree that can be something that can be really problematic and so you just have to have a good understanding of of the phenology between the um between the the pest and the and the the weather changes and or the seasonality
So in terms of uh, our third piece of information, our disorder or pest information, that goes us right back to the chapter that we just discussed um, with our diagnosis and our plant disorder. So going back to understanding signs and symptoms and all the different signs and symptoms that we went over, and there's still even more than that. And then really understanding what information we need about the pest. So we need a good description or identification of the pest or disorder, just like we need to know exactly what tree we're dealing with. We need to know exactly what pest we're dealing with, because if we're going to target it specifically, we have to know it and we have to get it right. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to um, target it correctly. We want to know the population level or the severity of damage uh, that's already out there. We not, want to know what life stage it's in. Kind of just mentioned that idea in the last slide. Uh, and then any symptoms and signs for the different life stages. And then what is our potential for natural control of the, pet, the pest? So the idea is, you know, is this, um, is this something that always happens and, and the area can recover on its own? Or do we actually have to uh, manage an area? Because we ultimately don't want to to do management if we don't have to. Management is only we step in because we need to to um, add value to this area. We don't want to manage and and be uh, be a cause of more problems or or really um, step in and do work when we don't have to because that's not going to be cost effective and it and it's just gonna um, kind of muddy the waters and many pests can only be managed during a vulnerable stage so we really have to get our pest information right and really have to understand what we're dealing with because maybe there's only certain times where it's gonna really it's gonna really work you know um, maybe when it gets really cold and that and that uh, insect or whatever it is that we're dealing with is really struggling um, the, one of the easiest things to think about is um, if you've ever applied herbicides, one of the, the times that they um, tell you is great to apply herbicides is right before whatever plant you're dealing with goes dormant. So basically it's, it's you know, giving up all this energy and it's like, I'm going to go dormant, I'm going to relax, and then you just pulverize it with herbicide and then it's, you know, it sits there and it's like, I, I can't fight this because I just I just gave up all this stuff so I could go dormant. And so it's understanding those sorts of things that maybe that a lot of pests can really only be managed during the vulnerable states that you're going to have to do certain things at certain times to really um, make it work. So you have to get all this information right about the pest. Key stressors and plants. Um, you really want to understand it for the region that you're in or, what, or however many regions you're going to be working in and is there you know uh, micro regions within that you have to see specific um, specific things um, one one way or one way I can uh, think about this is if you work on the coast um, there's going to be there's going to be certain regions like if you're down say in Santa Barbara you've got um, you know chaparral areas up in the up in the uh, hills that are going to be way different than if I'm just managing a, a park uh, right down on on the coast near the beach or even if I'm I'm um, starting to get mid slope and I'm dealing with more uh, conifers or or oak woodlands in that area but then you get a little higher up or a little more inland and you got chaparral so you've got definitely different um, different um, if you want to just look at these the Santa Barbara area or the central coast area is a particular region you still have a bunch of micro regions within um, that region and so you want to know your key stressors and your key plants for your area your key stressors are going to be pests or site conditions that are frequently encountered in landscapes and predictably cause injury to your landscape plants whereas your key plants there's two types uh, it's either a species that has a high incidence of pest problems due to inherent susceptibility or common mismanagement so something that is just it's there and there's definitely a chance that something could go bad um, emerald ash borer we know it, the emerald ash borer only attacks ash trees. So if you have ash trees, might want to be, you know, really thinking about, well, how where is the emerald ash borer? Has it spread to my area? How far is it from my area? What is the chance that it could end up in my area? Or that sort of a thing. Number two, in terms of key plants, a specimen that might be uh, highly valuable due to its location, function, size, appearance, historical significance, or cultural significance. So 
how do we define that? Well, let's think about this. Maybe you've seen this because you've been to Central Park in New York, or maybe you've just seen it because you've seen a whole lot of movies about New York, but you got these sorts of trees right here just lining this walkway, creating this beautiful um, urban ecosystem. Now, what happens if something happens to these trees, if there's a disease that starts to affect these trees? These, to me, would be trees of cultural significance. Now, there's definitely trees of way more cultural significance. You're going to have trees that are important um, to certain groups because of their religions or or um, if you're dealing with native populations, trees that are just of um, cultural significance due to, um, due to uh, beliefs. You might have um, something like the banyan tree in India, which is like the national tree of India. So that's that's the most important tree. If you think about just even on on simpler levels, uh, California, right? We think of the redwood tree, and anywhere you'd have a redwood tree because it's California, you want it to be a big, beautiful redwood tree because it's California. And so it's that sort of idea when we're thinking about just a, a tree that's important for uh, for some sort of re reason, some sort of cultural reason that's another idea of how we would uh, consider it to be a key plant and so let's talk about uh, health management strategies so we're really talking about pest prevention and we really want to focus on uh, two ideas we want to minimize plant stress be by improving our site conditions making our site as great as we can because if it's a great site less problems or we're going to minimize pest activity by discouraging conditions that favor its development so we don't want pests to become a problem like this emerald ash borer here so we want to minimize its activity by discouraging conditions that favor its development well what are you talking about well if i don't have any ash trees in my park don't have to worry about emerald ash borer sometimes it's that that easy sometimes it's definitely not that easy so Let's take the emerald ash borer and think about it. So we know it only it only attacks ash trees, but what else can we know about it, and how else can we really um, solve the problem? One, we got to make sure that we know what emerald ash borers look like. So an adult beetle is metallic green; it's about a half inch long. It's got that um, elliptical shape to it, and if we um, look at if we see some damage in our trees. The adults are going to leave a D-shaped exit hole in the bark. So if you have an exit hole, but it's not in the shape of a D, we're not dealing with emerald ash borer. We've got another problem that we need to figure out, but it's not going to be this one. We know that um, that firewood has been problematic and has helped spread the emerald ash borer to different areas. So really making sure of your firewood and making sure that people aren't bringing in firewood from all sorts of um, all sorts of different areas. But then we also know stuff like woodpeckers really love to eat emerald ash borer larvae and so uh, you can if you see a bunch of woodpecker damage on your ash trees it may, it may be a sign of infestation but also maybe an I idea that maybe we want to keep a thriving woodpecker population to make sure that we um, can avoid uh, having problems with emerald ash borer but then we also have to really make sure that the woodpeckers themselves don't cause a problem so that's kind of the way we want to think about it so how do we actually do that well we have management options and what we want to do with our management options is we want to basically break it down into three different areas we're going to have civil cultural controls so when we're talking about civil cultural controls and i'll move myself out of the way so you can see my little um, picture there with the different techniques that we can use um, what are what are the ways that we can do it civil culturally so we can create an unfavorable environment for the pest we can create a favorable environment for their predators. Um, we can thin out some trees, so get rid of some trees. We can do sanitation cuts, so the idea that it's a diseased tree and we're going to get it out of there. Um, we may submerge logs. We may put in a sprinkler system that adds um, that irrigates the area more and creates more moisture, which may create the um, uh, uh, problems for whatever pest that is. Uh, we really want to think about a forest mosaic. So in our urban forestry landscape, um, sometimes we end up like that area of Central Park that I just showed. It was the same tree over and over again. And maybe we want to throw in a few different trees so that if we have something that is attacking uh, those specific trees, we do have some other trees that um, that we can look at or, or um, 
or really kind of spread out the problem as opposed to have it be focused and and then all of a sudden just lose all the trees from an area. Uh, you want to pile and burn your, your slash or basically your leftovers. So if I have to go do any of these thinnings or sanitation cuts or when I do pruning, I really want to get rid of all that stuff. So maybe um, maybe that's piling burning depending on how rural your your urban landscape is or maybe it's just the idea of of chipping it and then um and then that chip then gets taken to um some sort of a um forest mill where then it's going to be burned but that's to you know keep the engines running at whatever plant it got take uh take to and then uh took to that's the word i was looking for and then um possibly debarking logs but that's you know where we're really talking more about the idea of um if we're if we're using our urban forest uh, area for uh, still for um, production, which is not super common, but it does happen. We also have biological controls. Got to move myself out of the way. Again, there's a good spot for me. Um, so we want to uh, we can do this by encouraging enemies, encouraging predators for for areas, or disrupting their reproductive or growth processes. So fungi, bacteria, viruses, and predatory and parasitic organisms could come and play a role in this. Um, but the hard part is sometimes this has led to the introduction of some uh, exotic species of insects because then if you got rid of that by bringing in this other thing, that could um, then be problematic because then what's going to control this other thing? So we really don't want to get into that nemesis effect idea of just like creating problem on top of problem on top of problem and it just kind of gets worse and worse. We, that's where this whole idea where we back it up and we say this is plant healthcare. This is based on the ecosystem. This is a holistic approach. I got to think about short term and long term and how is this going to affect the whole area? So what is going to be the best option? Um, birds are actually a really good biological control because a lot of our problems are insects and birds love eating insects. Um, and then also the idea of intraspecific competition. So we have inter between two different species and we have intra between the species. So maybe we get them to fight each other gladi gladiator style and, and kind of take themselves out or, or reduce their numbers uh, so we don't have to worry about it. That's also um, one way to think about a, a biological control. And then our third management option, and the one we want to avoid um, at, at, uh, at all costs if we can, because it's, it's, it's the most expensive and it's the most controversial, um, but it's, it's both of those things because it's also the most direct form of control is the idea of chemical controls. And when we're talking about chemical controls, insecticides, pesticides. So insecticides really focused on the idea of, of getting rid of an insect. Um, the insecticides are going to be categorized by how the poison enters the body. So it's either going to be like a stomach poison, a contact poison, or it's going to be a fumigant. fumigant. Uh, your pesticides are going to be classified according to their chemical makeup. So inorganic poisons, chlorinated hydrocarbons, carbamates, organopho organophosphates, natural plant products. Uh, you also will have some systemic toxic chemicals that can be applied to the soil and the tree can take it up. But then the pest eats the tree and then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, what did you give me? So there's all sorts of different ways to do chemical control. But... The big thing with chemical control is can we can we control it? Can we really make sure that we're hitting that target organism and not any of the other things? And and sometimes it's really hard. And that's what I got. That's plant healthcare. And to me, you can do it and think about it in all sorts of other ways and with all sorts of other things. But really what it comes down to is the idea of the ecosystem approach in a, in our urban landscape what is everything that we have to take into if i do this one thing how is it going to affect everything else so what is the best option and that's why really trying to make sure that we just avoid problems in the first place is always going to be the best option because then we don't have to worry about how it's going to affect everything else and what sort of domino or nemesis effect we're going to deal with so 
really focus on that holistic idea. See the whole picture. Think about the short term and the long term and really try and benefit the whole urban ecosystem landscape.